Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm looking at a video that gives us 10 reasons to believe in Jesus. I assume that when they say believe in, they don't just mean believe that he existed, they mean believe the whole story, miracles, death, resurrection, everything. So let's see what those reasons are. We're going to start with a two-part top 10 list, the top 10 reasons to believe in Jesus. Let's take a look at the first five. Yep, that's right. This one's going to be a two-parter. Number 10, the name of Jesus Christ. The name of Jesus is a household name, but it's also a mainstream curse word. Really? People use Jesus as a curse word, therefore he must have been God? This list is definitely going to be high quality. Well, I mean, I guess this is number 10, so it should, in theory, get better from here, right? It's not uncommon to watch a blockbuster movie and hear the name of Jesus misused again and again. Jesus fucking Christ, really? That's terrible! Somebody should do something! But think about it. When was the last time you heard someone stub their toe and yell, Ow, Muhammad! Who founded Islam? Well, the problem there is that we live in a culture where Islam is the minority, so it's just not something that we would be culturally familiar with. And when you go to such places where Islam is the majority, such utterances could very well lead to jail time or even execution. If I could be arrested for my earlier Jesus fucking Christ, I'd probably not say it. But please don't take from this the idea that blasphemy laws are a good thing. They are absolutely not. If God is fragile enough that somebody saying his name without the proper amount of reverence hurts his feelings, then that's his problem. He shouldn't need humans enforcing that sort of thing on his behalf. Or, oh, so that's a Guatemala. Who founded Buddhism. I mean, again, when we look at the largely Christian culture of North America, Buddhism is an even smaller part of it than Islam. And again, when we look at countries that are run by Buddhists, we see blasphemy laws that prohibit any insult towards Buddhism. Now, I'm not familiar enough with these countries' cultures to say whether or not someone is likely to say something like Siddhartha Dammit when stubbing their toe, but the fact that they feel the need to protect the religion from insult implies that there is an equivalent behavior that they frown on, just like you frown on the impious utterance of Jesus Christ. Have you ever heard anyone curse the Hindu gods Brahma, Vishnu, or Shiva? Again, I am not familiar enough with Hindu culture to say whether or not Brahma Dammit would be considered blasphemous, but historically Hinduism actually didn't have a concept of blasphemy. That concept was introduced to India by the British when they were doing their whole colonize the world thing. India technically doesn't have any blasphemy laws on the books, but they do have a clause in one of their libel laws about hurting religious feelings, which effectively works as a blasphemy law. Probably not. No, I'm not suggesting we misuse anyone's name as a curse word. You literally just did exactly what you're saying that you're not suggesting that people should do, complete with irreverent silly voices. If I were to make a silly little cartoon of someone stubbing their toe, followed by them saying, Jesus Christ, would you not consider that to be offensive blasphemy even if I did it with that silly voice? You can't do the thing that you're complaining about to other religions and then follow that up with a statement that you don't endorse that sort of behavior. It just completely betrays your hypocrisy. But isn't it interesting that no other name is misused more than the name of Jesus Christ? So let's say I just grant that point. I don't, I'm not even sure how one would go about figuring out which deity's name is used most frequently in cursing. But if I grant that, what does that mean? Well, Christianity is currently the world's largest religion. By extension, this would mean that people who are not themselves Christian would be more likely to be exposed to Christianity in their everyday lives than any other religion. So if they don't take Christianity seriously, but it is a major part of their culture, which religion do you think they're going to turn to when looking for language to use that will be shocking to people? Because that's really what swearing is all about, the shock value. So. Best case scenario here, if I grant your entire argument, the only thing you could really say about Jesus being a swear word is that it's because the religion happens to be the most popular. So this ends up just being an appeal to popularity. Lots of people like this thing, therefore it's true. But there's actually an even simpler explanation than that. How many religions are there that prohibit taking the name of their god in vain? 
Hinduism certainly doesn't. I'm pretty sure Buddhism doesn't. There are sects of Buddhism that don't even have a god, so I doubt that they explicitly forbid taking their non-existent god's name in vain. Islam does, but they also don't consider Muhammad to be god, so I'd imagine that saying Muhammad damn it would carry a lesser sentence than saying Allah damn it, though I am certainly open to the idea that I am wrong about that. So it's not just the popularity of the religion, it's also that the religion specifically forbids using God's name wrong, which nowadays is interpreted to include Jesus, and so when looking for taboo words or phrases, it just makes sense. Is this random coincidence? No, of course not. If people would stop taking it so seriously, it would likely fall out of favor, eventually. If you look at archaic swear words, most of them seem just downright silly to us nowadays, dad blame it. I'll bet you're a total flapdoodle when it comes to the quim. You're probably a real arfarfenarf too. To translate, I just called you a drunkard who's really bad at satisfying women in bed. The fact that people like you continue to take it seriously is what makes it an effective swear word. Number nine, today's date. Look at your calendar and check today's date. You'll see a month, a day, and a year. The life of Jesus is so significant that it literally marks a distinction in our historical timeline. Wow, it's actually hard for me to decide which of the two arguments we've heard so far are worse. So, little history lesson here. The Gregorian calendar that we currently use was implemented in the 1500s by Pope Gregory XIII. Emphasis on Pope. It's basically identical to the previous Julian calendar, but it does a better job of matching the calendar year to the solar year, so it makes leap years simpler than they were with the Julian calendar. So it was a fairly minor change, but being implemented by a pope, what event do you think would have been considered significant enough to start counting years? You guessed it, Jesus. Except to figure out when Jesus was born, he was using calculations by the Christian monk named Dionysus, who got it wrong. If Jesus lived, he couldn't have been born later than 4 BCE, because that's when King Herod died, and Jesus was supposed to have been born during Herod's reign. But also, he can't have been born earlier than 6 CE, which is when the census of Quirinius took place, which is the census identified in Luke 2 too, even if the author of Luke got the scope of the census completely wrong. So no matter how you slice it, Jesus was not born at the start of the Gregorian calendar. So if that's an argument for Jesus, then Jesus needs to get some better people to calculate his birth date. If it weren't for a pope imposing a new system of counting years, we'd likely still be using Julian years, which would make this the year 2774. But hey, as long as we're using our current calendar to prove that Jesus was really God, how about January, named after the Roman god Janus? Or March, which is named after Mars? May and June get their names from gods as well, and don't even get me started on the days of the week, those mostly come from Norse mythology. The calendar works just as well for evidence of all these Roman and Norse gods as it does for Jesus, so why don't you accept any of them? And hey, many Roman emperors actually put out decrees officially changing the names of the months to honor either themselves or their ancestors instead of those gods, but the names almost always reverted to the names of the gods. So not only are they named after gods, but they stayed that way despite decrees from emperors to the contrary, so it seems like they have staying power enforced by God, right? Either that or the calendar is just a bad argument in general. The Gregorian calendar is the most used calendar in the world today, and it includes two periods of time, BC, before Christ, and AD, Anno Domini, which means in the year of the Lord. Yep, it does, and it also contains numerous tributes to various other gods, almost like this whole thing is just completely irrelevant. Now we can attempt to rename these to the Common Era and Before the Common Era, but that doesn't change the historical significance. It's not trying to change the historical significance, it's just a matter of convenience. It would be ridiculously hard to try and get people today to accept a new dating system, so rather than change the years, we renamed the BC and AD to acknowledge the fact that not everyone who uses this calendar considers us to be living in the Year of Our Lord. But again, this is just an argument from popularity. The calendar that happened to catch on is the one that also happened to have its years based on a religious figure, therefore all the stuff that is said about that religious figure must be true? It just doesn't follow. Of all the people who have ever lived, only the life of Jesus marks today's date. Except it really doesn't, because no matter how you look at it, they got that calculation wrong. Number 8. The Virgin Birth 
Every human being who has ever lived was conceived by the human reproductive process, except Jesus. Just say sex. It's not a dirty word. But really, ignoring the fact that the virgin birth narrative is likely the result of a mistranslation of the Greek word Alma, which meant young woman of childbearing age, but through translations on the telephone game it led to the author of Matthew using a word that just means virgin when he was quoting an Isaiah prophecy that, when read in context, can't even be about Jesus, but ignoring all of that, what you're trying to tell me here is that if I don't believe the Bible when it says that Jesus is the Son of God, then I should change my mind about believing that because the Bible also says that Jesus was born of a virgin? I really hope this list gets better soon. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born to a virgin woman named Mary. Evidently, Jesus had 23 chromosomes from the Holy Spirit and 23 chromosomes from his mother Mary. Which then leaves us wondering, why does God need DNA? Does God's body also have cells with DNA in them? What does God DNA look like? And in order for God to successfully mate with a human, the DNA would have to be nearly identical, which means that there is a bunch of evidence in God's genome that shows that God shares a common ancestor with chimps. So God is a great ape, I guess? Therefore, he is the only one who can rightly claim to be fully God and fully man. That's not how numbers work. 23 chromosomes from God and 23 from Mary equals a total of 46, which means that if 23 came from God and 23 came from Mary, he is half God and half man. I feel like you just saw that we have 23 pairs of chromosomes, and then also saw that we get 23 chromosomes each from our father and our mother, and then missed the fact that 23 pairs equals 46 total chromosomes, and so figured that 23 plus 23 equals 23, making Jesus' DNA 100% God DNA while still being 100% human DNA. But hey, let's actually just keep in mind that if we're using creationist logic, in order for God to successfully reproduce with a human, God would have to be humankind. So God isn't really God because God's just a human. To be fair though, I don't know if this organization has creationist leanings, but the idea of God having DNA just brings up so many questions. No other religious figure in history can rightly make this claim. The word rightly is doing a whole lot of heavy lifting there, because virgin birth myths are all over many religions. Of course, it kind of depends on how you think about a virgin conception. The Bible is rather scarce on how the Holy Spirit did its conceiving, but given your assertion that Jesus actually had God chromosomes, I'm going to go ahead and assume that this resulted from a sexual union between God and Mary, because that's how chromosomes get there. The virgin part is actually kind of irrelevant. The important part here is just the conception was the result of a supernatural activity rather than just ordinary sex. With this loose definition, pardon the pun, we get all sorts of divine conceptions all throughout non-Christian myths. Hercules is a pretty famous example. Romulus and Remus were supposed to have been born of a virgin. Hera, Zeus's wife, regained her virginity every year with a magical bath and conceived Hephaestus sans sex. Horus was the result of Isis using a magic dildo, or hell, even if we want a virgin who never had sex, conceives without sex, and makes it all the way past birth without ever having sex, then the mother of Perseus fits the bill. The oracle at Delphi predicted that the king would not have any male children, but his daughter would, and that child would eventually kill him. So he locked his daughter up so that she could never have sex, but Zeus came to her as a golden rain that fell into her womb, causing her to conceive Perseus. And I really could go on. There are a bunch of stories like this. My point is, Jesus' miraculous conception was nothing particularly special in ancient myths. Number seven, undeniable miracles. During the height of his ministry, Jesus publicly performed miracles on a regular basis. Wait, I thought you said these were undeniable miracles. I was expecting some modern, well-documented miracles that are attributed to Jesus. The miracles that Jesus performed in the Bible are most definitely deniable. The earliest book that records any details about his miracles was written at a minimum 30 years after he died. What sort of assurances do we have that the stories of the things that Jesus did during his lifetime were not embellished over the course of those decades? Maybe Jesus was pretty good at magic tricks, but the stories of what the tricks were got exaggerated over time until they became downright miraculous. 
If we're just going on an assumption that the Bible was completely accurately depicting the events of his life, then it doesn't really follow that one part of the story would be used to bolster another part of the story. It's all the same story. This would be like saying that Aragorn really was a Sildur's heir, because only a Sildur's heir can summon the army of the dead, and Aragorn summoned the army of the dead. I summon you to fulfill your oath. None but the king of Gondor may command me. We fight. Like, if you don't already believe that the Lord of the Rings is telling a true story, appealing to another element within the story as proof that it is true won't actually convince anyone. You can read all about his miracles in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And nowhere else, unless we want to start looking at the Apocryphal Gospels. The question here is, why should I believe that what those Gospels are saying is true? What's fascinating to me is that no one living at the time, not even Jesus' enemies, dared to deny the miracles were authentic. How would you know that? The only record we have of these supposed events is the record of the Bible. To go back to the Lord of the Rings analogy, that would be like saying that not even Sauron denied that Aragorn was a Sealdur's heir. In fact, he freaked out when he learned that Aragorn was still alive, and he sent his forces into battle early because of his fear of what Aragorn could accomplish. Nobody denied that Aragorn was a Sealdur's heir. There was some resistance to the idea of him actually taking the throne, but the fact that he was a Sealdur's heir was never challenged. Aragorn, this is Isildur's heir. Gondor has no king. Gondor needs no king. There were too many witnesses. The best they could do was declare they were the work of Satan, or they were some form of black magic. But no one dared claim they didn't happen. I claim they didn't happen. Anonymous accounts written decades after the fact are not good sources for these sorts of events. Who else do you know who's ever performed miracles like these? Lots of magicians have duplicated Jesus' miracles in modern times. A magician duo known as Barry and Stewart have actually aired multiple TV specials where they perform the same miracles as Jesus. Walking on water, turning water into wine, feeding 5,000 people, etc. So unless you mean to tell me that these two are also God in the flesh, I don't really find it all that interesting that some pretty mundane magic tricks were attributed to Jesus decades after he died. Number six, prophecies fulfilled in Jesus. There are over 300 Old Testament prophecies or predictions about the Messiah, the savior of the world that are fulfilled in Jesus. No, there aren't. Those lists of over 300 prophecies always stretch it quite a bit. And even the prophecies that I would agree are messianic prophecies, when looked at in context, they usually don't fit Jesus very well at all. And the predictions are very specific. They correctly foretell where he will be born, Okay, for that one they are listing Micah 5.2, which says, But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient days. Okay, first, Bethlehem Ephrathah is clearly a tribe of people that was too small to be considered one of the twelve clans of Judah. So it's not talking about the city of Bethlehem, it's talking about someone from the tribe of Bethlehem Ephrathah. Second, when we look at the larger context, this prophecy is talking about someone who is going to save Israel from the Assyrians, not just some general savior guy who's going to die for your sins. It's talking about a military leader who will fight against military occupation. His family tree. Okay, so Genesis 12.3 and 2 Samuel 7.12-16 are supposed to be prophecies about the genealogy of Jesus. Genesis 12.3 is literally just that spot where God pops in to tell Abram that he is going to bless those who bless him and curse those who curse him. He does end it with the line, in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed, which I suppose could be a reference to Jesus being everyone's savior. But really, even if I count this as a prophecy that points specifically to Jesus, all it's saying is that the Jewish Messiah will be Jewish. How prophetic. 2 Samuel 7, 12 through 16 is God telling David to build a temple for him and promising that if he does, he will make sure that one of David's heirs is always on the throne of Israel forever. Now, I'm sure the I will discipline him with the rod of men with the stripes of the sons of men line has been used to tie this passage in with Jesus before, and I can see how you might think that, but that's supposed to be what will happen when this person commits iniquity. Do you believe that Jesus committed iniquity? Most Christians don't, so if you believe that Jesus was perfect and blameless, then this passage cannot be about Jesus. 
Also, there's nobody from David's line on the throne of Israel today, so no matter who this is about, it is a failed prophecy. That children will be murdered in an attempt to kill him. Jeremiah 3115 says, Thus says the Lord, a voice is heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel is weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children because they are no more. Not only does that not even come close to saying that children will be killed in an attempt to kill Jesus, but again, in context, it's in the middle of a poem about the reunification of Judah and Israel. It has nothing to do with Jesus. Where he will live. Hosea 11.1 1 says, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. Not only does that not predict where Jesus would live, Jesus was supposedly from Nazareth, not Egypt, but it isn't a prophecy. It's in the past tense. It's talking about the Exodus story. The types of miracles he will perform. This one actually looks at first glance like it might be saying what they claim it is. The eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped, the lame man will leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. Not sure what the waters break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert could be referring to. Did Jesus do any magical water summoning? I don't recall that miracle. But then, when we do that dreaded thing where we read the verse in context, it looks like this chapter is a whole long list of signs that the ransomed are about to return, and it doesn't actually say who is doing these things, just that these things will happen. And the list includes a bunch of things that Jesus definitely didn't do, like the desert rejoicing and blossoming like a crocus, followed by the desert itself rejoicing with joy and singing. Did Jesus make the desert sing? I know he said that if the people stopped singing then the rocks themselves would start, but to the best of my knowledge he never actually made anything like that happen, just claimed that it would. Also, the burning sand will become a pool and the thirsty ground springs of water. The haunt of the jackals where they lie in the grass shall become reeds and rushes. Sounds like a lot of water in the desert type stuff that Jesus was supposed to do, but never actually did. When did Jesus turn a jackal lair into a wetland? Where is that miracle recorded? This seems like cherry picking to me. Specific details about his death. I'm kind of surprised that they're citing the entirety of Psalm 22 for this one, because while that one does have a couple of lines that sound like a crucifixion when taken out of context, on the whole, it's very obviously one of the Psalms that is supposed to have been written when King David was in exile, hiding out in caves and such. And it has lines that are definitely not crucifixion related, like many bulls encompass me, they open wide their mouths at me, like a ravening and roaring lion. But also, when we look at the part that does make us think of crucifixion, it says, Dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me, they have pierced my hands and feet. That line about dogs at the beginning of the verse makes me think more of getting your hands and feet bitten by dogs than of crucifixion. And indeed, if we look at the footnote for that part of the verse, it says that some other manuscripts render this verse as, Like a lion, they are at my hands and feet. Which is definitely less crucify-y and more animal attack-y and that he will rise from the dead, just to name a few. So there we reference Psalm 16, which is another one of the David in Exile Psalms. These particular verses read as though David is simply trusting God to not let him die. It doesn't say anything about anyone coming back from the dead, but this has one of my favorite verses in the Bible, verse 11. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. That sounds like eternal masturbation to me. And so this is to just name a few? So when choosing from a list of over 300, do you think you would choose your best or your worst? It should be your best, should it not? And these are supposed to be the best? It's kind of pathetic if you ask me. No wonder you just gloss over them quickly, apparently hoping that nobody will check the verses that you're citing and will just assume that they actually say what you claim they are saying. It would be impossible for anyone to engineer these kinds of details about their life. Honestly, it's actually kind of pathetic how few prophecies Jesus actually fulfilled, given that the authors of the Gospels were writing their stories with full knowledge of Jewish messianic prophecies. I feel like they could have done better. But in my opinion, this is just evidence that the stories were fairly well known by the time the Gospels were written, so they were stuck with certain details that were already considered canon by their community. Unless, of course, the prophecies about him are true. Or, the stories about him were written in a time when the prophecies were well known, and so his stories could be tweaked to at least appear to fulfill some of the prophecies. And that's it for this one. Hopefully part two actually gets into some good reasons to believe in Jesus, but I have my doubts. 
Today's comment of the day comes to us from Dolores Lehman, who says, Okay, I know this is a really terrible analogy, but anyways, the way Alan Parr talks about Satan is a bit as if a Star Wars fan said, of course it was clear from the beginning that Darth Vader must be Luke's father. The whole story hinges on this fact. Without that, the whole saga would make no sense at all. Well, I actually think that's a pretty great analogy. For context, this is talking about the fact that the character of Satan, as he is understood today, doesn't even exist in the Old Testament. So, in retrospect, Darth Vader being Luke's father turns out to be a pivotal plot point in the original trilogy, and is pretty pivotal to the overall story arc. But if you go back and watch A New Hope, despite what George Lucas says in interviews, it's pretty clear that he didn't consider Vader to be Luke's father. In fact, Vader was a kind of secondary character. Governor Tarkin was the main villain, and Tarkin was actually above Vader in the Imperial hierarchy. Governor Tarkin, I should have expected to find you holding Vader's leash. But anyway, in the scene where Obi-Wan is talking to Luke about it, there is not so much as a hint that Obi-Wan is lying about Vader killing Luke's father. It's all played out very matter-of-factly. I mean, it could be that Obi-Wan is just a really, really good liar, but cinematically speaking, that would have been a great place to drop a subtle hint or two, which we never got. And fans have gone back and reinterpreted that scene to fit with the later interpretation of the story, despite there not being any hint of it to be found. So. It's kind of the same as what Christians have done with Satan. Thanks for watching, thanks to this week's PayPal hero Charles, and special thanks as always to my patrons, Jeffrey Dahmer, Mark McManus, Mark Hetchum, Clench Eastwood, Lynn Dobbs, What Jesus, and all the rest, who are the signs and wonders that prove that my channel is the rightful king of Gondor. If you'd like to join the Army of the Dead, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino. If you feel so inclined, you can also support the channel through direct donation or my Amazon wishlist, links to social media, all the ways to support the channel, and to my other projects like my podcast with my daughter can be found at links.vicerhino.com. If for whatever reason you want to send me stuff, my P.O. Box address is in the description. See you next time!